All right, guys, welcome back to the Buck Fever podcast. I am Noah, and this is Jake. And with us today, our second guest on the Buck Fever podcast, Mr. Pat Colby. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no Good problem. Too. We're super excited to have you here today. And so I guess let's start with a little bit about who you are and how we know you. So Jake and I went to the same high school. I'm a year older than him. And when I was a freshman, you were the head football coach at our school. And so you were my coach for a year. Um, and then you're a Phi Ed teacher at our school. And so we had you, I mean, I think I had you three years maybe. I'm right, sure three years. Yeah, yeah, four years. Four years three or four, yeah. a couple of classes. So. Classic three times a day last year. Yeah, so a coach of mine, a teacher of both of ours, and it was pretty early on, I would say, in our relationship of knowing you that we start talking about hunting, stories start getting shared, and it was pretty obvious that you were a big hunter, big fisherman, and outdoors went all around. Um, and so, you know, we just kind of as the years went by, I got to know you a little bit, and we just kind of kept the relationship going now, and now we're both out of school, but it was, when was it? August, maybe? Like, right, no, it must have been September, right before the season was going to start, that I started thinking a little bit, got some ideas flowing, and I went to Jake, and I was like, buddy, do you think we should ask Colby if he wants to film for us this year? And so then we kind of talked about it a little bit, I was like, yeah, I just ask and we'll see what happens. And so then I went to you and asked you the question and got you the cameras and you tried it out a little bit and filmed for us this year. And unfortunately you didn't have quite the success that you <laughs> wanted to have, but that's all right. Yeah. Anytime, any year where you get to be out in the woods and at least give it a shot is a good year or so. Um, yeah, you were telling me you have 25 years plus of hunting experience and fishing for as long as you can remember so yeah it makes me feel pretty old saying i've been hunting for 25 oh, years oh please <laughs> no 36 uh, i didn't start as early as, as you guys i started when i was 12 um, with my dad shotgun hunting in, in catamount county uh, i grew up in chilton so um, i didn't actually go hunt until i was out of high school it wasn't something I did. I was just so consumed with sports. I played football, basketball, and baseball, and sports kind of consumed everything I was doing. I loved hunting. I, I always looked forward to gun season, but right. um, I really didn't start bowing until college. Um, when my buddy Brad said, "Man, you got you got to try this bow hunting stuff," um, and I was hooked like right away. I mean, once you graduated from high school and didn't have those sports to play, you're looking for something to fill. All that time and that passion and man, I, as soon as I was in a tree with a bow, I'm like, this is it. I love it and been loving it ever since. So it's basically an addiction now. <laughs> yeah, it is for us I too. Agree. And, and it's, that's almost a similar thing for me because we only gun hunted too. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, it feels like everything that I've gotten into with this, whether it's bass and northern fishing or bow hunting or whatever, but my younger brother actually started at first. He just wanted to. Like, I think he wanted a bow for Christmas, and he got one, he started target practice, and this was years ago, so it was like a little youth bow, you know, you can't shoot a deer with it, but that's just kind of how we both got into it, and so all of that came from him, too, so I feel like that's kind of a pretty similar start for both of us there. Mm -hmm. And all of these bucks that you see here, these are all Colby's, and they were all shot in the same year, also, so 2020? 2020, 2020, right? The year this, everyone hated, it was an awesome year yes, for me. Yes, so. <laughs> definitely, lots of success there. And basically, that's all to say that uh, Colby is a pretty respectable hunter and all around outdoorsman. You've uh, you know, had a lot of success and obviously your fair share of struggles and you know, you've definitely been through it just like anybody else has, but you've also a lot of success. Yeah, you, and you've spent a lot of time, you've done a lot of research, and so you, you definitely have, you know, a lot of success. So, but first, before we talk about any of the hunting, last week, because this will come out a week after 
our first ice fishing video of the year. Um, so we, we did that. Uh, we got, I think it was over 15 bass in Northern. So we had a pretty successful trip, but Colby is actually the, what would you call it? The leader, the coach? Coach. It's a coach. Yeah. Coach right. advisor. So the coach leader. of the fishing team at our high school. And that's something, I mean, I'll let you talk about it, but I don't think that's a very common thing at most high schools. I think. No, it's, it's so, we run high school ice fishing team or fishing team really, we do ice and open right. water. This is the, the 12th season we've been, or I've been running it. Um, we've been one of the first high schools in Wisconsin to get started um, way back in 2011. There might've been a, a dozen, maybe 15 schools that year that maybe got it going. Um, and now, now there's like maybe 120, 130 in the state that do it, uh -huh. um, but still rare when you consider how many schools right. there are in the state. Um, but it's been awesome. I mean, we we just had our first event uh, like two weeks ago out on the ice. We got another tournament this weekend coming up, but we basically do events or tournaments throughout the state from the first week of January all the way through the end of February. So. Um, it's been awesome. We've had anywhere from 20 to 40 kids in the club every year, and it's just a great opportunity to work with those kids, get them out on the ice, doing something that's, uh, you know, it's a lifelong activity, just like hunting is. Uh, I mean, you can do it forever and, and build relationships with other other friends and people and and uh, make memories out on the ice or on the water or in the woods. Um, it's just been an awesome opportunity. I enjoyed it. It's been the most rewarding coaching experience that I've ever done. I've coached football, basketball, baseball for a year. And those are all great. I love team sports as well, but so many of team sports, like once you're done and you graduate, like you don't play anymore. Like right. Maybe you might go pick up basketball at the YMCA or something, but sure. you're not playing any real competitive stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. So few kids go on to college and play, but you can fish with a buddy for the rest of your life. So um, yeah, it's been awesome. It's, it's been great. I mean, it has to be the most popular sport that we have at that <laughs> school, right? I mean, would you say? It's yeah, because yeah, you, yeah. Have, you have boys and girls, yep. right? So it's, girls, not, yeah. it's not secluded at all. You can Everybody can do it. It's freshmen through seniors. Everybody can be a part of it. Sure. I think right. it fits our school, too, just kind of. Right. I mean, yeah, th this area, yeah, a lot you of have so like many people. Join it all, so. Right. So that's definitely... Definitely, uh, I know a lot of kids are very thankful. A lot of people that follow us are in that club or, or were, yeah. and yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of people that are very thankful that you know that opportunity was available at our school because, like we said, it's not a super common thing, and so to be able to do that is pretty cool. And for you to be able to run that and sort of lead that, and it's grown a lot too. I mean, you have some of the, all the prizes that they can win at these tournaments and yep. all the, all the, there's so many tournaments, all the events that you guys get to do, it's pretty crazy. And actually one of the tournaments was from last week's video, which I was filming my brother who took second, lost out by a quarter of an quarter inch, inch yeah. <laughs> which that was wild because that's over three days. That, fish. Yes. And then that walleye on Sunday night that came in, everybody was off the ice. You know, they got the app where everybody can see what they're catching and yep. that all slowed down. Everything was done and it was like six o'clock or something and put that walleye in to take the lead. And then Brady must have caught the ass, ass on, on Monday to, to pull ahead by a quarter, yeah. hour, quarter of an inch oh, yeah. and then win the event. So, yeah. And Ben and Nate were trying. They were out there on Monday and they just... Went to the wrong lake, tried for the wrong species, and it just didn't... They were fishing next to me, maybe that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You didn't catch anything? No, I mean, uh, seven perch uh, and keepers, so it was okay. But yeah, that's all right. It, uh, it helps when you bring a working ice drill out on the lake. I, I got out there and I went to drill my first hole and the, the battery was dead. So we ended up, I, had we ended up on some, I had to go knock on some guy's shack and bar was handed. Oh, out, man. So. We, had, we had two <laughs> that day, and... My dad pulled the ripcord out of ours. Yep, I heard that. Story. And so then that one was just done. Yep. And then Nate's dad had an electric one, and it just ran out of juice. We had it for a while. We had both of them for a while. It was when we tried to pack up and move to a new spot that we realized we don't actually have any augers <laughs> to drill any holes. So I took my dad keeps a spud in the, all of our gear, and so I just found some holes that 
guys must have drilled like the day before or whatever that were out towards where we wanted to and just started going to town and cracked through so we could get a couple Old of school. Ups in there. Like, yeah. I remember some days when I was young and my dad, we lived, we grew up on Lake Winnebago, my parents had a house on the East Shore and he would send me up to ice fishing, gave me a chisel and little did I know, I was literally spooking every fish within probably three miles away, trying <laughs> to pound through 12 inches of ice so I could drill drill myself three holes right. and then set some tip ups and then sit up there and not catch anything all day. But well, good life lessons, hey, work for it. We noticed that even when we were fishing and running out to our tip ups, like the, we were fishing in maybe three, four feet of water, so yep. fairly shallow. And especially the bass, they would suck that sucker in and then they would just not move it, just sit there. So the flag goes up and then the reel's not spinning at all. And it would start spinning like when we got closer, like they could hear us running yeah, sure. towards the yeah. tip up up there and then they would kind of scatter. And I think we lost a couple of them. Yeah, there's definitely certain lakes where we got to like tell the kids like hold back on the excitement the flag goes up we can't have 15 people go run in the tip right. up because the fish is just sucking on the minnow and it'll drop it as soon as it hears like all that commotion mm -hmm. coming by and sometimes you just gotta relax and the flag goes up and give it some time and yeah so we had to kind of work through that and learn that the hard way a little bit but eventually we got it and now coming up here another tournament this weekend the pika palooza yeah yep Anywhere in uh, three different counties, Green Lake, Marquette, Dodge County. Teams can go anywhere on any public ice. And uh, I think there's gonna be about 23, 24 teams involved in this one. So Saturday, gonna be fun. Yeah, Looking and it's all, to it. all pike. Pike, bass, and walleye, like your top okay. eight, any combination combined total length. Okay, so. those are my favorite fish too. So I'm excited. I think we're gonna go film that, see what we can do. And hopefully we'll get a video out after this podcast goes live as well but all right I think I think it's been long enough I suppose we should probably get into the, the deer here a little bit yeah I'll let you decide on the order I mean it's your story so whichever one you want to start with well, here. we can go in order of the deer that was shot I guess okay. so um yeah 2020 one of those years where you know a lot of people couldn't wait until it was over and I was like man 2020 can go on forever it was just a great year all the way around for me other stuff hunting uh Hunting certainly, but just a lot of other things. 2020 was a great year, but this was the first one. Um, this is my bull buck in Wisconsin. I killed him on the second weekend of the season. Um, so an early deer, you can probably tell that by the very, very thin, silky coat that uh, he has. Um, we don't actually have a name for this deer. We originally thought he was a deer we called turkey foot because of his mm -hmm. little split up there. Yeah, kind of looks like a turkey foot. Um, but we did some more review and then like a week or two later found out the real turkey foot was actually still alive. So <laughs> well, I don't, we don't even know uh, what this deer was, but we had him on camera a lot. Um, in the preseason, um, I don't know the exact date. I want to say like September 19th, something like that, September 20th. Um, the crazy thing is the night before I was hunting the same tree stand and this deer had been showing up at at a water hole with another buck, uh, another really nice buck, almost like five, six days in a row preceding when we were sitting. So those were like the two bucks I expected to see. Um, but then two different shooters, um, a really nice, really young, it was super hard to resist, a uh, 10 pointer that probably scored in like the mid 140s. Oh, but well, we thought he was like uh, a really young one, so he was like, on our pass list. Um, he came to the water hole first and I ranged him after he left the water hole at like 45 yards. He was heading out to the field. And behind him was a, a buck we called BG um, for Big Giant. My daughter actually named him. And we showed her a picture and said, name this deer. And she said, Big Giant. Um, nice. And he was definitely on our list. So he drinks some water and he gets to that 45 yard spot and I stop him and I had an absolute clear lane to the spot. I uh, hit him high in the shoulder and we did not find him. Um, we tracked him a little bit that night and it was just like miracle. Finding just a speck of blood, speck of blood, speck of blood. Actually kind of funny story with that. We hadn't found any blood. All we knew was he ran down the bluff. This is in hill country like Vernon County, mm -hmm. bluff country. And we hadn't found a speck of blood and I randomly, there's a lot of random stuff that happens when I hunt, but 
I randomly stopped to take a leak and I jumped up. It was like super steep hill and there was this little flat spot. So I like got myself up on the flat spot so I could like be stable. Right. And halfway through taking a leak, I looked down and I'm like, dude, I got blood. <laughs> and there was a speck of blood there. So that's how we originally found blood for that deer. Um, we let them lay overnight because it was just like speck here, speck there. We went out in the morning and tracked him up a bluff to a bedding area, down a bluff and up to another bedding area. And then it just disappeared. And it was just like, miracle. like again, just a miracle track job. Like we'd have nothing and then we'd find a drop of blood a hundred yards ahead. Mm -hmm. And then we mess around for a half hour or nothing, find a drop 75 yards ahead. Like there was no consistent blood. So we were very, very confident that deer survived and he did. He uh, he made it to this year and he was one of our hit list bucks, but ended up getting shot by the neighbors. But um, anyway, you know, so you, you kind of are tucking your, your head between your legs a little bit. You're, you're disappointed. Um, that was the first buck I've ever like shot at and, and not recovered. Yeah. Um, but there's only one thing you can do is get back in the tree and get after it again. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what kind of helped me is we ended up finding my arrow the next morning and the broadhead had literally broken off, or the arrow had broke like a quarter inch behind the broadhead. So I knew I had zero penetration and that just yeah. confirmed that I hit him in the shoulder. So between that, no blood or very, very little blood and the fact that he went up and down two bluffs were like, this deer is doing fine. And that helps. Um, yeah. Like it, the the worst thing is if you shoot one and you know it's dead and you can't find oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Or there's a chance it died and you can't find it. If you know he's gonna live, I guess that helps you sleep at night a little bit. So. Yeah. So we uh. We get back, you know, kind of midday and, and regroup and and I told my buddy Eli, I said I, I think I'm going back in the same set. I said this this buck and uh. The other one didn't show up. And they typically had shown up from the opposite direction that the deer had shown up the, the night before. So I said, maybe they have no clue that any of this really went on. Um, so I get back in the tree that afternoon and sure enough, like six pointer comes through. And then here comes that 145 inch 10 point. Oh, the same deer from the night before, not the one I shot, but the one yeah. um, that we had decided we we're gonna pass and he sits broadside at 15 yards for 20 minutes and I'm just taking pictures of him videos of him he has no clue I'm there and man that I never touched my bowl it was like <laughs> I don't have a ton of like 145 inch deer on the wall so it was a very very tough pass but yeah. you could just see the potential his, his nickname was perfect 10 because he literally was just a perfect 10 and we really thought he could turn into something someday so yeah. he ends up going through and goes to the same water hole and walks up to the field and uh, a little bit closer towards dark, all of a sudden see some movement down the hill and uh, got binoculars up and I knew it was this deer right away. Uh, my, only, my only worry there was uh, the wind had died. The wind was perfect when I started. It was blowing like up the bluff, but then it went flat calm. And this is learned with experience over time. Like we didn't know this when we first started hunting this property, but wind currents and thermals when that wind dies at night and the sun goes down, that air is gonna get sucked down, mm -hmm. down the bluff. And now, <clears throat> you know, at this point in my career, I knew this was happening and I knew it was not a good situation. And I knew my wind was going right, or my air current was going right to that, to this buck. Um, and he sticks his nose up in the air and I thought it was done. I'm like, he's got me. But I think what saved me, it was early in the season and that was the first time he had ever smelled yeah. a human. Mm -hmm. If that was October or November and we had been hunting, you know, a handful of times, I think he turns around and goes back down the hill. But it was the first time, the second time in there, but the first time I think he's smelt that human intrusion and I got away with it. And he ends up coming right on by. I think I, I made the shot at seven yards and uh, yeah, he didn't, uh, he didn't go too far. So um, yeah, awesome deer. Um, again, we don't have too much, like we don't have any picture history to tell how old he is, but we did talk to a, a neighboring guy that said he had him, on, had him on camera and estimated him at five and a half based on pictures he mm. had. So He's um, got some mass there. He's got some really cool character. He's not yeah. a high like scoring deer. And to me, honestly, I'm, I'm not a big score person. I use it as like a frame of reference to like talk about how big deer are, right. but I don't 
I mean, I don't care. It, it doesn't, I don't know, I could care less what a deer scores. Um, he's just got a ton of character, really cool, beautiful coat. He was a huge deer. We didn't weigh him, but I mean, he was well over 200 plus pounds, so. He must have been making some scrapes. Too. He was, he's got some the, rubs. Yeah, he's yeah. got that's a little bit cool. of a tree up there. No. Yeah, that's really neat. Yours had that too? Yep. Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. It's all caught up in there. Yeah, that's a really nice buck there. That already just in itself would make your year. Right. Without the rest of this <laughs> even happening. So I've just... never, in the 25 years I've been hunting, I've never shot two deer, in the, or two bucks in the same year. I've never shot, like, doubled up with a bull buck and a gun buck just in Wisconsin. So, yeah. you know, to get one of this caliber down already, you're like, all right, year's made. Mm -hmm. Everything else from now is gravy. And it just kind of was awesome from there. Yeah. Um, just with this buck, but that, really taught us was like just the power of water in hill country um these deer were literally going to a blue kitty pool that yeah. you can buy at walmart for like 15 bucks that we had put out five years earlier and we kind of like never even paid attention to it um i had walked by it going to the stand um and i just kind of like looked in there and there i mean it was ounces of water there I mean, it's not like it was full it was, whatever it had rained is what water was in that kiddie pool and that was enough draw where all these bucks that would come before they go out to the field of the beans they would stop at that uh kiddie pool and it was funny because you could sit in the stand and you could hear them in the pool because that cheap plastic yep. you could yep. hear them stomping around in there um but that really um was kind of a light bulb moment for us and now we've this past year for 2021 we put out two water holes um, like heavy duty 110 gallon tanks yeah. and they were a major draw all the way from early season all the way through the rut like our best cameras pictures came on water yeah that's the way i go in other than hill country like i have a river that runs right in the property but if they don't have to cross the road they won't we have six five or six fifty gallon tanks all across the yeah. 80 acre property on that side and they check it every day yeah you know? and they need water just yeah. like you and i need water to, to survive and whether it's early season and it's hot, or they start running around in the rut. They'll come they're... through and break the ice and drink. I'd watch yeah. them come yeah. through and kick the ice out and yeah. drink it. And... I thought for sure, like even in 2021 here, like once it got really cold and that thing iced over, that they that the pictures would just go dead. No, they were there. Like yeah, those, yeah. I mean, just some type of deer were there every day, like mm -hmm. trying to get in there and drink water. Mm -hmm. Well, and the positioning of it too matters. If you can get adjacent to bedding and then food and you get it all in the right area. Yeah, we're trying to put our, our tanks in between. Like we know, you know, we've been on this property for enough time now, but we know we're generally we're deer bed and we're trying to get these water tanks in between where they bed um, and where they go eat. Exactly. And then try to hunt, you know, yeah. in between catching them there. So. so did the kiddie pool have characters on it? Like was there an octopus? Uh, you no, know, it does, like, it does. I, really? They were all faded out, I can't tell you what they are. But, you know, <laughs> oh, for that's sure. Awesome. It was, uh, who knows, G.I. Joe or something, or maybe Spider-Man. Oh, uh, nice. It doesn't even phase them. No, no. It doesn't, once they get used to it, it, it doesn't phase no. them. I mean, it doesn't have to be a camel pattern or yeah. black. Ours are blue, too. Yeah. Blue and white. Yeah, like blue. Mm -hmm. Well, and if they they yeah. have enough other senses to know where danger is at. And they then, realize it's a it's not danger, it actually helps them. They're like, right. oh, I come here and get water. Yeah. They're not going to freak out over it. The problem with the kiddie pools, and I'm surprised ours was still... Uh, up and running after five years is their hooves will bust yeah. through that plastic. Mm -hmm. Whereas now these 110 gallon heavy duty farm tanks, they're, they're not busting. We had that so problem. Well, do they crack like when it freezes and then thaws? Or, yeah, or they'll crack from the freezing yeah. thaw. Yeah. But I think even more so just like the, the hooves. Yeah, they're sharp. Stuff, they're sharp, yeah. Man. For sure. All but right. I mean, for 15 bucks, it's a cheap replacement. You know, the 110 gallon tanks are quite a bit more, but if they're going to last longer, that's what we've gone to. Do you fill them up with like a four-wheeler or just rainwater? Uh, four-wheeler, we, this year, like we had to bar, that's one of the things on, on my buddy Eli and mine's on our, on our list of things to get um, because we were borrowing it from other people and it just was kind of a, too much of a hassle. So we just said this year we got to get our own. Yeah. yeah, on tank where we can fill it more consistently because the every power of the draw. Yeah, for sure. We go up there every week and we'll fill. Yeah, because they drink it so quick. Yeah, yeah. especially in the summer and then get some in routine and get pictures of them and stop mm -hmm. at the farm, fill up the water tank, and then check the can on out yeah. and yeah. fill them all up. And yeah, we have a good system that mm -hmm. you just hit each one and grab the camera that's on right there and. Especially to keep the four wheeler running, they don't even. Yeah, it's just minimal intrusion and you just keep going. I bet they probably, some of them are going to hit it 
that afternoon. Oh, I've drove in multiple food. times and they just, they're better right there, just sitting there, you know. All right, so. You know, everything really too, squirrels, raccoons, oh. all kinds of oh, wildlife yeah. like, comes and drinks out of those things. It's funny watching squirrels when the water's low, trying to like hang on with their paws and well, like get down there and get a drink. Don't you, you put a stick in it? Uh, we've had we one should. too many. Yeah. <laughs> we've had one too many squirrels, rabbits, mice die in there. And then yeah. it pollutes the water, so you yeah. don't drink it. So if you throw like a yeah, log in there, they just there. run up and down it. But you filmed a couple times squirrels in there. You had like twenty birds sitting on the yeah. log one day. I shot you that one squirrel that one day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Water is definitely a very important thing to have in any way, and that's you know that's another thing about you don't have to buy a property that already has water on it, you can make yeah. water. You can put the spots out there and get it there. And even if you can't refill it with a four wheeler, if, even if you're just relying on rain to fill yeah. it up, like that's not the best thing in the world, but even if you could do that, that's still- yeah, Anything's better than nothing. The nearest water yeah. to this property is, is miles away. So we're yeah. like, how can we get these deer? To stay. Water. They're lazy just, and they're smart. If they don't gotta go anywhere, they're not gonna. Yeah. I know we kind of preach that in one of the podcasts, but. Food and water and bed, and they have they don't need anything else. No yep. cover. Mm -hmm. And if you hunt it right, and you don't ever spook them off of that. You know, if you smart about your wind and your thermals and all that, mm -hmm. and you never spook them off of that, then they're going to be just fine, and stick around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, okay, are you ready for the next one? Yeah. All right. So you know, it's tough. Like you love shooting one early, right? Like you. Right. But now you're, now you're sitting there and your tag's filled and man, man, I love the bow hunt. Like, what am I going to do? I got, I got three times. There's a lot of season yep. left before, you know, Wisconsin transitions to gun season. You know, there's a month and a half. Like, what am I going to do? Um, and I had public land gun hunted Minnesota the year before and really got my butt kicked. Um, barely saw anything. But it had opened the door to... Um, just expanding horizons, doing different things. Um, and for me, for my house to drive to Minnesota or to drive to um, where I hunt south of La Crosse, it's roughly the same uh, same time. So I said, I'm gonna buy a Minnesota bow tag and go over there. And th the crazy thing about this is I was doing it solo. So my, my buddy was, uh, I was staying at his house, uh, 2020. The best thing about that is gas was cheap. So it was <laughs> 99 cents. Um, it was over an hour trip just to get to Minnesota from his place, but at 99 cents a, a gallon, I was waking up at three in the morning and driving over an hour to park, to hike into public land um, and do some bow hunting over there while he was trying to still fill his Wisconsin tag. So um, just getting out of that comfort zone, like you, if you would have told me to do that five years ago, I would have said, no, I ain't mm -hmm. doing that. There's no way I'm not going by myself and, uh, and figuring that all out. But I told I Jason about this year, you refused. You wouldn't do it. I still had to film. Oh, please. <laughs> it worked out. It worked out. So I, I think the first two days I had hunted uh, Minnesota, um, I had seen some deer, but nothing of the, the caliber I wanted to shoot. And I had hunted two separate properties. And these are all day sits. Like if I'm driving an hour, I'm not, I'm, I'm sitting all day. Yeah. I'm not getting out and going anywhere. Maybe I would, there was the second day I went back to the truck and I think ate a sandwich and then I was back in the stand. So I spent about five minutes in the truck and the rest of the day in the tree. Um, and then the third day, there, there's always been this property that intrigued me, just looking at Onyx maps. And we had thought about going there the year before gun hunting and, and we didn't go in there. And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna go for it. So another 3 a.m. wake up, another going out there in the dark. Um, this was over like, a, I think it was like 1.2 miles in, something like that. It was a river bottom. Um, there's a lot of bluff country over there too, and I dabbled in that a little bit, but now this is river bottom country. So um, some marsh, some, it was a, basically a river with a 100 to 200, not even 200, probably a 100 yard wide strip of good hardwoods next to it. And then there would be some CRP, some thick popple stuff bordering that. So I, in my mind, it's like, well, this could be a nice runway for deer to just run this hardwoods along this river edge. They're not gonna cross the river. Well, they, they will, but the river's pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna get in between again where I just projected that they'd be bedding and a food source. Um, and so I had set up there, never been in this property before, and get up in a tree uh, and look over 
and literally about 10 yards away from this tree, it's like there's a scrape about a half the size of this table. It was like the biggest <laughs> scrape I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'm like, all right, this must be a pretty legit spot. Um, and the, I think I saw a doe, a small block. I had a, a very, very tight, young nine-pointer come in and check that scrape. It was awesome. It was like, he's up on his hind legs, like licking the branch. Um, he worked around me for a little bit. Thought long and long and long and hard about shooting that deer because it's public land by yeah. himself. Um, decided to pass. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's like 1130. So late morning, and all of a sudden, further on down, I see three shooters, dog and a doe. Um, yeah. And they just get to an area about 100 yards away from me, and they stop. And they're just messing around for the longest time. And it's super windy. So that it's like a southeast wind blowing at like 20 miles an hour, coming across the river, blowing my scent back and these deer over here. So I'm trying to call, but I don't, you know, there's no response. Um, after a while, like it seemed like they would come and go. And then I thought there was about 160 to 170 inch deer in this group. And I thought I saw them bed down behind this like massive log or downfall and I actually texted my texted Eli I'm like dude I do you think I can sneak up on this deer like, I honestly think I can he's only 100 yards away the wind is blowing 20 miles an hour and I think he bedded and he's faced that direction and he texts me back so I'm like you're freaking crazy yeah, no, don't, right. don't do that stay in the tree right well it's like 10 minutes 10 15 minutes later I, I, I thought I had seen these deer get up and leave and then all of a sudden I heard just like campers crash over in the thick stuff huh? and I just said to myself like now is my opportunity to go get down and move to where they were and hope that they come back right so I'm gonna climb her climb all the way down throw it on my back everything packed up and I'm just walking super slow trying to get to that spot um, and <laughs> mistakenly I'm not paying attention to the place that I thought the deer bedded and I'm like looking in the air looking at trees where am I gonna get my climber? Yeah. Well, my climber catches on us on a on a stick and cracks. And if that 170 inch buck doesn't jump up 10 yards away from me, he was bedded in the exact spot I thought he was. Oh my! And I had snuck oh, man. To 10 yards with him. He had no idea. He didn't even turn around and look. He just bolted out of there. Yeah. Um, and went to about 60 yards and stopped. And that's when he turned around. So I don't, he never even saw me. He just like got up because of the noise of the crack of the branch. Yeah. So as soon as I did that, I immediately like dropped down, threw my climber off, and I'm like, oh my God, what did you just do? You just blew it up. And I saw him like work back like five yards towards me, and he's looking, trying to see like what made that noise. And all I'm thinking is, you idiot, you just blew it. Um, he is not gonna come any closer. And he didn't. Um, but I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I hear a grunt, and 30 yards away, this buck stands up, who is also bedded. <laughs> and now he's looking at me because I was trying to range how far the, the big one was. And now, but he's got me kind of pegged, but he doesn't know what I am because I had like full face mask on. So he starts walking towards me. And he's getting closer and closer and closer. And there's this huge tree like 10 yards away. And he's coming behind it. I'm like, this dude's gonna come around that tree and he's gonna keep walking at me or maybe he's gonna charge me. He's gonna be on top of me. He's gonna be on top of me. Yeah. So I'm sitting here like, shoot this dude, or probably about 2% probability that I'm gonna get oh, this thing. So tough. he gets behind the tree. I'm like, you know what? You're on public land. This is the first public land deer ever. You're taking him. So as soon as he gets behind the tree, I draw. He comes around the tree and I shoot him at like nine yards right through the chest oh. on the ground. Um, he basically did like a backflip. <laughs> the hole was massive. He basically did like a backflip and ended up you know, running off into the thick stuff. Um, and that's where he died. And I'm just trying to collect my thoughts like what in the world just happened? Like I just spooked this magnum. This deer, I just shot a deer on the ground. Like, yeah. This is crazy. How am I gonna get this thing out of here? Exactly. I'm by myself. Um, and then I'm just kind of like, what happened to that deer? Well, I end up standing up to go 
you know, my slide had settled for like two minutes maybe, who knows, maybe less. And I go check for blood. I take like two steps and that 160 is still standing there. Oh man. And then a doe stands up oh, right next to him. Yeah. A doe was there with these bucks and he wasn't going anywhere unless she yeah. would bust yeah. out. But I don't regret the situation because he would have either charged me or figured me out and probably blown up yeah, yeah. Yeah. situation and that deer would have been gone anyway. But you know, once the doe saw me now standing up, uh, she gets up and runs off. Um, and I watched the, you know, the 160, 170 inch buck, one of the biggest bucks I've ever seen go running away with her. Um, yeah. But awesome, awesome, super awesome experience. Um, so I, I, I get, I find the deer, I got it out and it's like 1.30 in the afternoon. And uh, I'm texting uh, my two buddies in Wisconsin. I'm like, hey, got one. You know, they're like, awesome. Uh, I'm like, hey, I need some help checking this thing out. I'm like <laughs> 1.2 miles back here. It's through a bunch of like tall marsh grass. And they're like, it was Halloween. They're like, well, uh, it's one of the best days of the year. You're gonna have to wait till dark. Like, and I, and I didn't blame them. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to ask these guys to like forego one of the best uh, days of the year. But I'm looking at the clock. I'm like, those guys aren't gonna be here till like, they gotta get out yeah, of the woods, they yeah. gotta get to their truck, they gotta drive an hour here. I'm not gonna be here until eight o'clock. What am I gonna do for the next seven hours? So tie a rope to it and I start dragging it and I drug, drug it back to like where I shot it and I'm like, there is no way I'm dragging <laughs> this thing out of here. Um, but then again, I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, well, what in the world am I gonna do? Right, what gonna do what am I gonna do? So I'm like, you know what? Just suck it up. And um, I know sometimes I talk to kids at school about this and this is uh something i got from like mark kenyon's wired to hunt podcast mm -hmm. he always talks about type two fun where it something sucks in the moment and it's not fun but then as soon as you're like done with it you're like man that was awesome right it's like i can't wait to go do thing. that again yeah. yeah so needless to say between where i started dragging and when i got back to my truck there were about seven different times i think i was laying flat on my back staring at the <laughs> sky going Oh my God, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. <laughs> or if I or if I die here, it's a, you know, it's a pretty good spot. Yeah. Um, but I was gassed, I was exhausted, but when I finally put that deer like in the back of the, the tailgate, man, was that awesome. Um, just the exhilarating feeling of like, I just did this all on my own. Like figured out a, a piece of property, went on in. Um, shot something, draped it out all, all on my own. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So needless to say, that's like one of the, it's the smallest buck here, but probably the best story. And yeah, for sure. One's that, one that probably means the most. Uh, the most that story. one taught me for sure that like, I can get completely out of my comfort zone and I can do it and I can have success. And don't give up. And don't give up and don't be afraid to go do stuff like that because like, look at the experience, look at the memory. Yeah, and to go somewhere you've never been before yeah. and to just look at the map, use the knowledge that you have to kind of come up with a game plan and then just figure it out. Yeah, and it built the confidence that you can do that other places because, yeah. I mean, like I said, the year before we were, me and a different friend, uh, Brad, were in Minnesota and we kind of got our butts handed to us for three days. Um, and the, and really the first two days I bow hunted Minnesota, things weren't great, like I saw some deer, but wasn't, you know, seeing what I thought I could see. and. Mm -hmm. So now you're five, six days in of really not having success. And that kind of just taught me like, yeah, you can you can do this. You can get out of your comfort zone, figure something out and, and make it happen. So, yeah. So with that story, that gave me a couple questions. One was what, like, what's like your top range? What are you comfortable shooting at? Um, Kind of going back to this story, like it was that, 45 ish yeah. deal, but after seeing that, um, and I thought I was holding pretty good and I'm a pretty confident shot out to that distance, but just not knowing, like, did that deer duck like, in that middle snow second? And I don't ever want to like injure a deer. Um, no, well, that's not why any of us go out there to take erratic shots or to push the distance or to brag how far we shot a deer at. So um, I think since that experience, I, inside of 40, maybe even close, maybe inside of 35, I mean, you get deer like this inside of 10 yards, like that's a different experience than shooting at something at 50 yards. I mean, yeah. you talk about well, that's, cool. That's the whole thing. That's the whole that's part of the whole thing. Like, yeah. like mine, he had no clue I was yeah. there and he, he tried to pick us off. He stood outside the plot for 15 minutes before he even came in by me yeah. and yeah. I just looked and looked and looked and that's how we get that big. I mean, you're talking about 
heart racing experience when you get some nice deer in close on you yeah it's it's super cool there's it's rewarding too it's super you did it right you did it right you put yourself in the spot especially early season when they're not even rutting or anything like they're just doing their thing and coming so yeah I, I'm, well, I, I'm gonna say like 35 to 40 right now I, maybe inside of 35 i just mm -hmm. We're setting a lot of our sets now that every shot is inside of 35 yards. And that's what you should do. Yeah. I only ask because there's probably, there could be people listening that are like, 60 yards, you know, I'll shoot up to 60 yards in the bow. I mean, I've seen some of those people and some people do it and some, some people, people are- for their whole life. Uh, yeah, like, or if they bow hunt out west, yeah. that's a different thing too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole different setup though. Right. Too. Yeah. They're rocking way different sights and arrow grain and all that. Yeah. But so much can happen in that. When you start pushing past 40, you know, mm -hmm. does a deer, you know, even does a deer drop? You know, a deer drops a little bit at 40 yards. Well, now that impacts the arrow flight or mm -hmm. the arrow impact a lot more than that. Um, there can be twigs and branches and sticks you don't see between you and and that deer at that distance. There's just too much stuff that can happen. And like I said, I'm not in the business of trying to <laughs> wound these things. Yeah. I just yeah. want to make a clean ethical kill. So. so the point is, yeah, you know, out at that range, there really wasn't a decision to be made with that one. It's not like, oh, oh I could have tried to poke it. Yeah. It was just, yeah, you, you couldn't have done Good, that. Yeah. That, was, that was, you had to make the right choice there. And like you said, with this guy sneaking right up on you, there's no yeah. way you could have waited. He either would have gored you with one of his yeah. tines or he would have for sure busted you and yeah. everybody would have ran off. But yeah, yeah I was not ranging that bigger deer in, in uh, thinking that I was going to make a shot. Yeah. 60. I just wanted to get a frame of reference. Like I thought he ran to about 60 and I'm like, mm -hmm. is he really there in case he does come closer that I can kind of have a frame yeah. of reference, like how far away he, he truly was. So yeah, I would never take that shot. Did First the arrow shot. go all the way through him? It went all the way through him. Really? Yeah. What, that was my other question. What broadhead head do you use? That was with a wasp jackhammer. Mm -hmm. Both of these do. So that's an expandable two blade. Um, yeah, that, that really tore that deer up. Um, and I think that's actually a really good shot on the ground. And that kind of comes from watching a lot of like white tail adrenaline stuff. Where you guys have yeah, seen I've that seen where they're, where they're doing yeah. all of their hunting on the ground. Um, and they've had to take that shot multiple times mm -hmm. and it's been lethal. Well, it's especially on, your, on the ground because you're yeah. kind of level with all yeah. the organs. You're not in the tree where it's exactly. angling down. So yeah. I just from watching them make a lot of kills that way, I was extremely confident that that shot was going to be good so yeah i agree i mean that you don't have a shoulder blade or anything to worry about there that's just there it's yeah, everything yeah. you need to hit that, that's not that's not a shot i would take out of a tree stand from like, yeah from no it's not stand. but on the ground you'd rather ground, have yeah. that than even like coring towards you yeah, that's probably sure. not yeah. even as good as straight on what that would be so is that still that you still use that broadhead have you always or did you switch no, or? i've been tinkering a lot uh kind of going back and forth um between I do like that wasp jackhammer. I've had a lot of success with it, but also you know the failure of of the buck the night before that one. Um, some other people have had some too many people that I know have had failures with just mechanicals and period. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of really turned us off, and we're really tinkering a lot with fixed blades now. Um, just guarantee it's going to open. Uh, if you do hit them in the shoulder, I think you got a better chance. Oh yeah, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. I mean, I think mechanicals. You hit them in the any broadhead, you hit them in the perfect spot, they're going to be great. I mean, you're going to have good blood trails, you're going to have dead deer. Um, it's all about forgiveness. Expandables in the shoulder, I don't feel very confident about. I've seen enough and heard enough stories. Yeah. Expandables, like in the back half, like you make a bad shot in the hind quarter, I think you got a lot better chance at cutting that artery. I didn't deer. know a guy who did the exact same thing. He um, put it through his hands and the deer hit that artery. And So, you know, right there, they're, that, then they're a bonus. It's good to have one, but... I don't know, maybe sometimes I'm trying to hug the shoulder too tight and I kind of just want something that's going to maybe pound through that. Oh well, yeah, I'm... mine didn't pound out the back. I mean, it hit the back shoulder and yeah. kind of just stuck there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on the forgiveness that you want. You're usually going to get a bigger uh, cutting diameter with a mechanical and it might slice a little bit better, but you're going to lack the penetration and you know, the forgiveness as far as bone goes. Cause yeah, there's been plenty of people that'll shoot a rage and put it in the scapula and it just about bounces right back off and then <laughs> yeah. that deer just walks. So yeah, that's something that we've always kind of been talking about 
as far as broadheads and what kind to use and what we do. We stuck with the Rage tripan. Sure. That's what we shoot quite a bit. And so far we don't have any horror stories, but but also with ET, the one your dad shot, I don't know, does he get that if he doesn't have that? Yeah, it was rage. Yeah, I mean, did that cut the artery right here? Yeah. yeah. So. so it's always it's always a horse piece, but it's a good discussion to have. I think broadheads because a lot of people have different Oops. perspectives on that. Either so. way, you hit them where you're supposed to. You're gonna die. If you hit them where you're supposed to, and everything goes right, it all comes yeah, back to shot placement. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. And knowing what shot you're comfortable taking, what your range is. Don't push it. Don't you know? Don't yeah. take shots you shouldn't take, and then you're gonna have a much yeah. higher success rate as well. Yeah. So. All right, that's that's number two. So one one month was that? That was October. 31st. Oh yeah, it was, it was Halloween. Halloween was Halloween. actually my first ever, believe it or not, buck I've ever shot in the month of October. I've shot a couple in September and November, but never October until until that one. So so you're two months into the season. You got two bucks on the ground. Yep. Now you're moving into so, November. So the, yeah, so the the bowl tag from Minnesota was kind of like the bonus thing for me because. Mm -hmm. um, we had already agreed that we were going there for gun season. So I already kind of had that tag. Um, and the Minnesota one was to kind of fill that gap between the early bow kill in Wisconsin and when Minnesota gun starts, which is the first weekend in November, right? November. It's the, probably one of the earliest gun seasons um, of anywhere in the Midwest, uh, right in the middle of the rut. Um, and I'm sure people have different opinions about that in <laughs> yeah. Minnesota. Doesn't Michigan um, have that too? It's early? They're November 15th. Okay. This was like November 7th or 8th or yeah. something like that. Um, and if you recall 2020, we were supposed to go the opening weekend, but that was the weekend we had that massive warm front. It was like 75 degrees. Yeah, I was bowling um, in my nice. Maybe even pushing 80. Yeah, it was bad. So we actually that. made the decision like we're not going to go. So I was doing yard work that weekend. We got oh, everything done around the house. We didn't go hunting that weekend. We saved it and went like on the latter half towards that second weekend. Um, just kind of shifted our days off of work for that. Um, so now it's the, the, the second weekend. Uh, I think it was Friday though, I think I had taken Friday off. Um, so we, we'd make the drive from my buddy's house um, an hour and we go out there. And this is actually, so this is the, the top one over there. It's a, I go into the same spot um, that I shot this deer at. <clears throat> My buddy had to leave at 11 a.m. So we could only hunt until 11. And as soon as we got in the tree, it was one of those super cold, frosty mornings where everything's got that glaze of frost. Um, one of those mornings where like, you're like, this is gonna be awesome. But a lot of times what I've found like over experience now is those mornings, you think they're gonna be awesome and the movement sucks until that frost burns off. And then the movement finally gets good, like 10 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and that was so true this morning. I think I saw one yearling doe come through early, but otherwise it was dead. There was nothing. And you know, you're sitting here, it's like November, whatever, whatever it was now, 10th, 11th, 12th again. I don't remember the dates. You're like, it's, it's cold, there's frost, it's the rut. Things should be popping if nothing's going on. Um, but all of a sudden, sure enough, 10 o'clock hits. And I saw a buck off in the distance. 10.30, I must have been about, must have been about 10.45, and here come a couple does, like three does, like right past me, and I'm thinking, go figure, here we go, it's finally getting good, and we got to climb out of the tree at 11, mm -hmm. I'm like, dang it, I knew I should have drove separate, but you're driving from an hour away, uh, just the camaraderie of sitting with a buddy in the vehicle for that long, yeah. you know, we, no. God, we'll just go together, I'll come back with you. And now I'm totally regretting it. I'm like, I knew the freaking midday movement was going to be good today. And now we got to climb out of the tree. So he was on the opposite end of this block. And he texted me like, hey, it's time to go. And I had the truck. So I had to get out to swing around to go pick him up. He's like, I'm climbing down. I'm like, dude, I just had three does come by. Like, yeah. All right. I'm right behind you. So I let those does clear. I climbed down you know, climb my climber down to the, the ground, but I'm going really slow. And even on the ground, as I'm packing stuff up, I'm like keeping my eyes open because it's the rut and I literally yeah. just had those come by. Well, I don't even have my climber packed up and all of a sudden here he comes on the same exact trail following, you know, where these does were. And he had a broken leg and a shot across the, the face um, 
from, like, I think earlier that morning. And he gets yeah. to about 80 yards, um, 80 yards away, and I've got my muzzle loader, and I'm just bracing myself, leaning up against the tree. The climber's not even packed up, and took the shot and, and dropped him on the spot. Um, and I was telling you guys earlier, when we, when we came up to that deer, we couldn't find the bullet hole. So I thought I was the guy that grazed him across the, the face, and it's kind of cool you can see it on the, on the European mount there. But we yeah. thought that was the the kill shot that dropped him in his in his tracks, but it ended up not being it. It was a perfect shot in the chest later on, and we gutted him up or off, sorry, cleaned him up at the shop. So um, needless to say, I take the shot and call up Eli. I'm like, turn around and come back this way. I just shot a buck. He's like, are you kidding me? Like. So he ends up turning around and walking towards me and making the mile hike my way. Um, and we drove it up to the truck and then I think he had to work that afternoon. So it was like, he made it to work with like two minutes to spare. Oh, we got that deer. It was the same spot I had shot that, that buck. So, you know, it was a mile plus drag out. And, wow. But at least, thank God we had a, another guy along that time. Yeah. Yeah. To help with the work. So at that point in the season, you've got I'm three just bucks at. down. You got two of them that you shot on the ground. Yeah. Two of them came from public land. Yeah. And that's, just with that, that's a record year. It already was before all this stuff happened. It just kept coming. And you go and shoot this so one. So crazy. Yeah. So it was that same spot? That was the same like block of yeah. block of public, yeah. yeah. Same area. But that wasn't one that, or you don't think it was one that you saw? Uh, it it could have been. It could have been one of them from the, the from the weekend before, I mean, who, who knows? Hmm. So. Crazy. But yeah, that, so I'm on cloud nine. I mean, three deer in one year. I, yeah. I, have, I have zero expectations for the Wisconsin gun season. Um, Man. It just, and you, with, with COVID that year, I think school, we didn't have school that whole week, right? Over Thanksgiving, well, was, I, I think yeah. they gave us a week off. They were giving us week off left and right. Yeah, they virtual. Did. Well, that was my well, that week. I don't think we had any school. Yeah, I think you're right. So you know, opening weekend comes and goes. Um, my brother shot a really nice twelve point on I think Sunday. Um, big ten point or split G two or split brow tines on both both sides. So it was a twelve. Uh, but I haven't really seen a whole heck of a lot. Um, I think Monday morning, me and me and Dad stayed or we stayed up. My brother went back home. Um, Monday morning, I think we slept in. And we decided to get out pretty early in the afternoon on uh, Monday afternoon. Um, you know, a normal year we went to been, I went to been hunting, we've been back at school. Um, but this gave the opportunity to be there in a the tree. Um, and I mean, I, I wasn't sitting that long. I bet you I was sitting for a half an hour. So it was maybe 2.15 in the afternoon. And typically all the deer in our woods, this is a, you know, a, completely different property than this deer, this deer here. This is up towards Marshfield where my family has 80 acres and typically all of our deer come from the north and I just happen to spin around and I see this deer coming from behind me from the south and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I was like, that's the biggest video I've ever taken off of that property and he's like on a trail that's coming right at my tree stand and I'm just like almost in utter shock like this is happening again. <laughs> Like obviously excited, right? Um, but yeah, he was right on that trail, and and I was kind of afraid he was going to get my wind, so I wanted to to get him the first crack I could get at him. And um, I've I've never been a great shot with the gun. Typically, uh, up at our cabin, if people hear like multiple shots, they know who is shooting. <laughs> um, been known to be like three shots or more. <laughs> Um, so people tend to know when, when I fire, but this one, uh, confidence was riding pretty high on the season and I put it on his chest and squeezed the trigger and he dropped like right on the spot. And then I'm just like, <laughs> I called my dad right away and just elated. And I'm like, dad, I think I shot the biggest buck I've ever shot up here. Like, you know, he's 40 yards away and he's laying there. He's dead. Yeah. Oh, That's a good one. That one's got some character too. Some it's, cool character. Yeah. yeah. Some gnarly stuff down at the bases, the split G2. I don't, I never had him, or I never saw a picture of him on camera. Um, well, in each of these yeah. stories, too, like it kind of goes to show you why we love 
hunting so much because it never really happens the way that it should. They never just stand up and like meander on no. over and then you just shoot and there's always some sort of detail. Something goes wrong, something's crazy and that's what... What's crazy about this one is the direction he came from is like where we walked from. So I wouldn't be surprised if we walked within 75 to 100 yards of him walking in. Mm. Um, and we try to walk as quiet as we can or not. Yeah. You know, that's always a great debate too, is like, do you just go plowing in there and make a bunch of noise and go as fast as you can and get up in a tree? Or do you like tiptoe your way in and sneak your way in there? And we just, you know, they decided that day we were gonna tiptoe in in the afternoon and mm -hmm. walk as quiet as we could and as slow as we could. It took us a long time to get in. And boy, half hour later after sitting in that tree, all of a sudden he comes from dang near the same direction we just walked in from. Um, like he had, to, he had to cross my scent trail yeah. that I had walked in on to, to get to the point where he was, so. That's crazy. That is a heck of a year. Yeah. I'd say. 2020. So yeah, an unbelievable season. Like I said before, I had never shot a bull and a gun buck in the same season, <laughs> in any season prior, <laughs> more or less four. So, I mean, the freezer was full. Uh, it was unbelievable. Definitely. Yeah. I know Jake's got a full freezer now with a couple bucks and a whole bunch of does. And, Too many. Yeah. Not too many that it's illegal, no. but too too many that it's too many that you know it's a lot of food to eat. It's a lot you of gotta, freezer space. Yes, you got to give some of it away. But I thought we better clarify there. It's not yeah. not well, too many over the limit. Money, just had too many tags. Yeah. Oh man. I give out like fifteen doe tags per person. Yeah, I know. I know that it depends on the county too. But you got the farmland. Yeah, you got quite a few does up there. So. And we definitely put the herd on them this year, so they, you know, maybe a little too much. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little too much. We'll see what happens. I'm not worried about it yet. We'll no. see what happens. But one of the things that we talked about before we started recording here today was a buck that you shot a couple of years back that was particularly large. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what year that was, but that one I know, 2016. 2016, a couple of years back. It was bigger than large. It was, yeah, it was larger than life. That was, yes. Yeah, do you want to hear that story? I, I do. <laughs> I really do, yeah. Okay, uh, do you want to bring a picture up of it? I'll put it up on the, it up on yeah. The, all right. Well, well I can't. I, I gotta, I gotta find it. I'll just put it up afterwards, but yeah. yeah. I mean, the common theme with a lot of these stories is just kind of like right place, right time, and a bunch of crazy stuff has to go right, uh, or, or goes right for me, I mean. You know, that one just being on the ground and having the protection of that tree, uh, climbing down at the right time for that. You know, if you're halfway down the tree, when that one comes through and your gun's laying on the ground, like, that story doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and this one really is a <laughs> super crazy story of all kinds of timing events coming out um, or working out the right way. Uh, so this is back on this same property, uh, roughly 200 acres in, in Vernon County. And the, I think it was like November the 12th, something like that, 12th or 13th in 2016. Um, I was sitting in a, a peninsula that kind of sticks out into, into some crop fields. You know, we had, we had a stand on the field edge um, and across this cut corn field and another strip of woods, I'm just seeing action like all morning. I'm seeing bucks chasing does, I can hear grunting going on. Just, I don't know, I had to see about a dozen deer maybe. I'm like, oh, awesome, great morning, you know, but it's 150 yards away. Like I should probably do something and, and get out of the street because I need to get closer to that mm -hmm. action. <clears throat> um, and there's a bluff point that sticks out down here and we've got to stand just on the, the downward part of that, kind of in a saddle um, in between two different bluffs that we call junction because it's just like that saddle spot that they like to run in between the two ridge points, you know, we call that sand junction. Um, so I climbed down out of my tree, and I think it's like 8.30 in the morning. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get down to junction. Um, I start walking that way, and I said, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go as quiet as I can, because there's so much stuff going on, maybe something's gonna run up on me. Um, so I start walking, and in between the sand I was in and, the, and junction, there's another sand, mm -hmm. and it overlooks the field yet. And I walk past that stand, and then I turn around and look at it. 
I should really go sit up there and then I can still like see what's going on in the field. So I walk back, climb up the tree, pull my bowl up, hang it on the hanger, and I'm sitting there for about two minutes. And I go, you idiot, just, why don't you just walk to the stand you wanted to walk to? <laughs> so now I'm two minutes in which I just switched stands at 8.30. I don't know what time it is now, 8.45, 8.50. It took me 20 minutes to walk 50 yards. And I'm like, just climb down and go to the stupid tree you wanted to go to. So I'm literally in the stand for less than five minutes and now I'm sending my boat back down. <laughs> I climb down and I make my way to junction and it takes me another 20 minutes, half hour. Like I'm just taking a couple, it was dead quiet. So I'm just taking a couple steps at a time and stopping. And I maybe get, it maybe takes me a half hour to go another like hundred yards. Um, and I get to the base of that tree. I'm like, sweet. I made it without spooking anything. Clip my bow on. I take the first, you guys probably had this happen before, you get to a stand super quiet, you're pumped that you made it there. I take the first step on the ladder and what does it do? It creaks. Oh. Super loud, like that metal creak. Usually it's my release. And all I do, oh yeah, your bolt, like, release it on the ladder. Yeah. 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 You make it in there all quiet and you're, and you're excited about that and then something clanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I literally like throw my head back like, yeah, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm going to take the next step and out of the hollow, I just hear, and up comes this 10 point, just barreling out of there. I just remember this so distinctly. It looked like his eyeballs were going bulge out of his face. Yeah. Like he was either scared or was on something. Um, but he comes barreling up. And so I like jump off the stand, unclip my bow, and I'm like scrambling around trying to get an air line. And I'm trying to stop him as he runs up the hill. And boom, he's gone. I'm just like, what am I? I'm thinking I just spooked him with mm -hmm. that stupid creak on the ladder. So I'm dejected, like, sweet, made it all the way down here, and I just spooked a nice one out of here, great. Well, clip the bowl back on, go to take the next step, back onto the tree, out of the same hollow. <laughs> Up comes the four-pointer, and then two seconds later, the deepest grunts I've ever heard in my life, just that 12-point is dogging him and running that four-pointer out of there. Which is probably why the first 10 pointers yeah, eyeballs were bulging up. Yeah, he, he was kicked scared. First. Yeah. He was scared. Jeez. So this is going on, and I'm now scrambling again to get my bow unhooked and get an arrow in. And that 12 point runs that four pointer off, spins back around, and comes right at me. And he's across the ditch at like 20 yards, and he curls around this tree, and it looks like he's like death staring right through me. But I don't think he had a clue I was there. I just think he was looking for does. But he's like now staring right at me. And I'm ready to draw, but I'm not at full draw. I'm not yeah. He From that point, I think he just didn't see his does. He turns and goes back down the hill. And as soon as he does that, I draw. And I'm just like, I think he's longer than 30. Maybe 35. I put the 35-yard pin on him. Stopped him. He stopped for like a brief second, and I got a shot into him. And he goes barreling down the hill and I just take off running <laughs> to try to like, see where he's yeah. going. Um, and again, like just like a couple of these scenarios, I'm just like, oh my God, what the yeah. hell just happened? Like, exactly. All this crazy stuff just happened. Um, I call my buddy who, or Eli, who's in Minnesota hunting, gun. Um, I'm like, dude, I just shot Splitter 2. Splitter 2 is the nickname we had for him. Um, I'm like, I'm going to back out of here. I don't. I don't know how I hit him. I thought I hit him high and back and I'm going to back out of here. I'm like, any chance you can come over? He's like, I'm in the vehicle. I'm coming. Yeah. Cause we were after like, after this year. Um, so I went back, uh, I sat there for a few minutes to call my heart rate down because I thought I had a heart attack. And all of a sudden right out of that hollow, two does come up. And I'm like, that's the reason like he was kicking the mother bucks mm -hmm. out of there. There were two does with him or whatever. And yep. he, they were going over, must've been hot. Um, and that was the whole reason. So I step out of there, or back out of there. I go down to the, the farmhouse of the people's, uh, the land that we hunt at. And you want to talk about like the most nervous four or five hours, just, I couldn't eat anything. I could barely drink a coffee. You know, you're just got that, until you like get your hands right. on these deer. I probably would puke. I think I would You, know, you know, I wasn't very confident in the shot. I just, I knew it was, I was confident, but like, man, they're, they're, it, could, it could have not been good. Um, because it was a little bit high and back. I mean, the angle was good because he was so far quartered away. Mm -hmm. um, so I wait for Eli to get in from Minnesota. 
um, and then we go look for it together. And we go to the, the impact site, and there's no blood, no arrow. We start tracking them down the hill. No blood, can't find anything. So you go from like super excited going in there with your buddy, we're gonna find this deer, yeah. to like now you're just dejected. And I'm like, dude, I'm gonna go circle back up to like and just get a different vantage point. Maybe we're just not tracking down the right spot. And I walk back up to like, I'm trying to walk back to the tree, and all I hear is him down the bluff yelling, We got him, he's right here. We never found a speck of blood, to this day, never found the arrow. And he was dead like 60 yards away from where he shot him. Oh, just man. in the gully, buried down there. Um, so I mean, that's a buck of a lifetime oh, right there. Yeah. That is, I know you're not the big score guy. Did you happen to score that one? Score Valley 174. So. Yeah, boom. But yeah, yeah I'm not, that's, a, not a score guy. That, um, that's a stud for, though. Is that your biggest one? That's the biggest one, yeah. 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 Wow, so I mean that's a huge split G twos. Uh, yeah, just a, a giant deer, huge body. Yeah, I mean at this point I've put the picture in a couple times probably, but yeah, yeah. you guys can tell that's that's definitely a, just a monster buck, buck of a lifetime. But just all sure. the, the timing aspects of that story. Well, know? yeah, like, it's, again, it's like, the same thing. If I. Yeah, I could have hurried to that stand and been in the, up in the stand when the deer comes through. But then, like, do you get the shot off? Yeah, um, yeah. It's you know, as much what as if you I'm shoot halfway from, up, as much tree, as you shoot them like, from the ground, I don't know why you even I buy tree why, stands. Yeah, climb a tree. You <laughs> should just sit on the ground all the time, or just buy a ladder, and then you could like start getting up to it, or just come down <laughs> from it, and then bang, that'll be a buck right there. Yeah, so I mean, that's three deer out of the last uh, you know half dozen years that have been shot off the ground. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, that's, like he was so quiet when I was walking in there. When I shot later on, I'm like, I'm not seeing a thing. I couldn't find the trail we had made. Because you were loud. Yeah. There's, it's like a four mile an hour wind. I'm yeah. like, sweating like a pig. Yeah. And then like, there's no way I've even seen it here. It's always tough, and you always kind of, you always overthink it. Anything bad that happens, you always think, oh, that's the end. That's going to be, you know, I might as well not even sit yeah. now. But sometimes, I mean, it's just, it seems like that's always how it goes with hunting stories like that. Mm -hmm. It just, you just never know what's going to happen, even when things aren't going right. There you go. Yeah. I still have that in internal debate every time I go out. Like, should I just fly in there or plow through this? Like, just get in there as fast as I can, or do you tiptoe in and take your time? And so you actually, I probably lean more so that way now. Like, now I treat it, because I've shot three deer on the ground, I treat it more like as soon as I leave the truck and the bow's in my hand, like, I'm hunting. I yeah. don't need to be in the tree to be hunting. And, uh, now I just take my time, especially as soon as you like, if you're going to a stand in the timber, like as soon as you are in the woods, then I'm typically walking slow because anything can happen mm -hmm. at any time. I think it depends too with access, like certain properties, mm -hmm. if you're fairly certain where they're bedding and you have good access to a certain stand, it maybe makes it a little easier to walk in there a little faster. It's harder and, too. I mean, we're yeah. like talking early season, like. There's no leaves on the ground. The ground is soft. You can get away with going a lot faster because you're not making noise yourself. Mm -hmm. Versus as soon as you get like early November, leaves are on the ground. The leaves are crispy. It seems like yeah. every time you step on the ground and you can hear you like it counting away, it feels like you're making that much noise. Mm -hmm. Is it windy out? You know where it's covering your noise. You know, is it or rain it's wet? Rain and wet. Yeah. yeah. Then the leaves aren't so bad. But yeah, I don't know. I've never really. I guess that's never really been a debate for me. I've always just kind of thought slow and steady and go slow but there are some times where the leaves are so loud it's like it doesn't even matter doesn't how matter. slow you yep. go what what difference does it make because it's so loud you're going to hear it no matter what there's you times like that there. where like you said it just you're, you're so loud either way yeah i just sometimes with that i just i'm like i'm just going to just go i'm just going yeah. fast now because i'm making so much noise either way <clears throat> yeah so i mean that story that's 2016, it's a couple of years back. All these were 2020. And this year was a little slower, but it wasn't totally lost. You shot a buck this year. I did shoot a buck with, uh, with the gun. Um, and it's like a gun season that, interesting. I, I came down with COVID, um, or I tested positive for COVID on Thursday night before gun season. Uh, I kind of had a cold and was just kind of going to do a test out of uh, respect for my dad, who's 67, or 66, sorry, dead. Um, <laughs> You know, just didn't want to go to camp, being positive and yeah. pass it on to him. So I kind of took a test out of courteous for that, and then sure enough, come back positive. So I didn't even know if I was going to be able to hunt. 
Um, and here's kind of just getting out of the comfort zone again. I decided I'm waking up at, I think it was quarter to three in the morning. So 2.45, the alarm went off. I drove two hours up to our land, hunted all day, didn't get out of the tree because I wasn't going to go back to the cabin. No. Um, came back, hung around outside at the campfire, slept in my truck, um, and then, well, I wasn't even going to hunt Sunday morning. Even though I slept in my truck, I woke up and I was like cold, stiff. I didn't see any lights on in the cabin. Oh, I'm like, no one else is going today. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if I want to go out there myself and sit another all day. But all of a sudden I saw a light flicker on um, and it was my dad. And I'm like, all right, I'm going. Uh, so we went and he ended up shooting a, a nice nine pointer at 7.30 in the morning on Sunday. Um, and then we started seeing some stuff happen more towards midday. Uh, and, and we got a crack at a, an eight pointer similar, similar to that. But at this yeah. point, Having COVID, having put in a full day, sleeping in the truck. I wasn't sleeping in the truck again. I was going home. Um, I was more than happy to uh, to get that deer. And that was the only, only deer of the year. Well, that's another thing too, putting yourself out there. Again, just taking the chance and going doing it, sleeping in your truck. Yeah. As much as that sucks, as much as getting up early like that sucks. You know, like turkey hunting. Paid off. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Isn't that like turkey yeah, hunting turkey time hunting for us? Crazier. Usually when we get up. So oh no. It is fun. I'm definitely looking forward to that. And it's coming up before too long. You know, we've got some shed hunting to do in between. We already found one this year, but it wasn't anything too special, but it was a nice two and a half. Cool. To see. Just, yeah. It was good as early as we've ever found one. We just kinda I went on a couple of vacations, came back, and we were just itching to get back into the woods just for something to do. Went on the coldest day ever. Yes. And it was, <laughs> well, I mean, it's not cold as it was right now or when we were ice fishing, but it was it was cold enough that it was not great unless we were walking, which, you know, we were most of the time. Yeah, up in the first 10 minutes and it made the whole trip worth it. Yeah, for sure. Thought we might find a couple more, actually, because there wasn't a ton of snow, but so it was... Really. Yeah, it was a good start, and I guess we'd rather wait than get to find them all a little bit later, have something to do in March there when the snow starts to melt off. But mm -hmm. yeah, so coming up now, gonna do some more ice fishing, uh, no, sturgeon spearing. Yeah, show holiday and fun. Stur life. Sturgeon spearing, <laughs> yeah. Do you sturgeon spear? I tag along with people, I, I don't go myself. I am putting in for poigan tags. So okay. Like upper river yeah. tag. But yeah. I I think maybe one or two years I bought a tag. I find it relatively boring. <laughs> I mean <laughs> a lot of people do. it is. That's the thing. It is. It definitely is boring until it's not. And that's pretty crazy. And just like, you know, last year we spear. It was pretty boring for six years for me and then Yeah. Well, I mean I had a good season. It was my first year so, out. We went we went and did some scouting so early on, and I saw one. There. So I was like, well, yeah, you know, that's just kind of what happens for me. It's, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. I just attract animals. <laughs> and then one of the first days, it was in the first weekend that we were spearing, and um, Gabby got to take a crack at one, <laughs> and she missed, but it was kind of like, I don't know. We, I don't we think it was a miss. We, well, maybe she bounced it off its head or something, like, I don't know, the circumstances were a little bit goofy, but then I got to take a crack and I think I hit it and then it was just so far back in the tail that it kind of kicked it off and maybe I threw too hard, maybe I pulled the rope too soon, I don't know, but you know, so I see one and then I almost hit one or I did hit one, almost got one and then I got and to watch. to sleep in and not come with us to watch me spear one. And... Well, I, I missed you spearing one, but then I saw your dad and Gabby spear one, so... I mean, that wasn't wasn't a total loss. I do wonder about that sometimes, though. If I would have gotten up, what would have happened? I, my dad made me. Like, I was just laying in bed after the alarm went off, and he came here and said, let's go. It was a Wednesday, we had off of school. I'm like, okay, let's go. Yeah. First time, I left the shack the first time ever that day. I was sitting straight days for like every time I went before that, and I think, I don't know what I did. I had to get something out of the truck. I came back in like half an hour later, I screwed that one. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a big, like you said, almost a holiday for people around here. And even if you don't really spear yourself, you know, a lot of people end up going and they sit with buddies or, you know, just family, maybe people that do spear. And 
You know, it's it, in moderation. I think it can be all right if you only go once or twice in hey, a year. It's okay. I've gone the last two years with guys that have had upper river tanks, and they both speed one within the first hour and a half. Now that nice. is what, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. What I like. that's the way Under to go. Under two hours, yeah. sitting yeah. at nothing and seeing a fish. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the upper river is like money. The, 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 the rate is like yeah. It's much higher. Yeah. Well, I feel like people who don't get one, either they don't end up going out that much, or they pass on the smaller smaller ones. ones. Right. Because there's you end up seeing so many that if you get an upriver tag, you're taking off pretty much till you get one. Like you're taking off of work and yeah. And I know I'll be logging some major hours in the shack this year because this is the way my school schedule worked out. This is probably the most time I'll ever have off in my life to spear sturgeon True. until this thing goes full time. So <laughs> that I'll be out there quite a bit and sitting with Gabby, sitting with you, and just living it up. And hopefully my luck will continue with that because you know if I wouldn't have seen anything like most people do for years and years and years, I, that's that's tough, man. I don't know if I could do that. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, I mean, as far as all these hunting stories go with Colby and everything. I think we could probably talk for days on end, you know, oh, whether it's stories. hunting, whether it's fishing, everything we've gotten. And even if it wasn't about things that we got, things that we missed, you know, all the, even knowledge or any of that stuff, things that we've learned, we could, we could go on forever and ever. But, um, I think, best thing to do is probably save that for future episodes and you know we'll spring do this again or we'll i don't know i feel like we'll maybe start in a different kind of segment on buck fever a little bit shorter same kind of format as podcast but just a little bit more with one main topic so we'll see and hopefully you know we hope you keep filming for us a little bit here and there when whenever you can and we'll get you some better equipment get you some better equipment yeah <laughs> the, camera is, the camera we gave is kind of junk but it's you know i'll tell you what just filming got... for the first time really ever i mean i got a lot of respect for everyone that kills deer on camera and it's a lot to a it's a lot to drag out there you know mm-hmm. it's extra weight stuff in your pack uh you're usually carrying a lot of stuff out already because i don't like wearing a lot of gear. i don't like sweating walking to the gym yeah. so i'm carrying a lot of gear in um and that's just added added weight added equipment Added noise, added setup, so you got to leave a little bit earlier. Uh, give yourself noise. that time, a lot of noise, setting up. Setting up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we, we haven't always picked our, or our stands aren't set up with camera necessarily in mind, yeah. but I'm sure maybe you guys do that a little bit. So not, our, not every set yeah. is a, a perfect spot for no. a camera. I, I learned that out, or I figured that out. Uh, you know, sometimes I carried it out there and then never even set it up because I'm like, I don't even yeah. Where to go with it, or mm-hmm. you know, the place that it, the only place it does go is where I need to be able to. Yeah, turn. your boat hanging there. Yeah. So, yeah, there's uh, all these guys that, that kill my camera. It's it's pretty impressive. Yeah, especially when you're doing it just by yourself. It's a different thing if you have a buddy yeah, that's yeah. there with you. But even that with your dad with ET, like that was hectic. You know, that yeah, wasn't like the perfect. Too. Yeah, that's not the perfect situation. But and then you're dealing with double the scent, double mm-hmm. the noise. Uh, you know, and it's like we it's, it's like we talked about with you know you might have the perfect stand with the perfect camera set up and you think they're going to come from one direction and it'll be perfect you don't even have to move and they're not going to come from there yeah. that's just not how it works out they're always going to be a different spot mm-hmm. so yeah it's definitely definitely kind of a learning curve to get with that and it's an added challenge but cameras have probably saved a lot of bucks like probably <laughs> yeah. we probably have but Oh, I don't know. I, we love doing it, and we love making it happen. And when you do get them on camera, it's always a pretty sweet thing. So I watch those videos. I know, I really, day. yeah. I always watch them, and we're always glad when other people watch them too, because that helps us out quite a bit. But the point is, I don't think this is the last time that you'll be here on the channel with us. I hope not, anyways. It sounds so, good, man. I'm, I'm down to talk deer hunting anytime. Yeah. Outdoors. I hope we can get you in here a bunch more. Okay. So. Thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, you guys. No problem. Been a great time. And thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.